Lamborghini Super Trofeo, and it is rounds three and four here at Watkins Glen this weekend. When you look over the countryside, the greenery, the hills, the vineyards in the background, you might think that we were back in Monterey, California, where the season started, but that is not the case. The Finger Lakes area of New York, where they have been road racing since 1948, all started on the streets of the village of Watkins Glen, New York in 1948, then moved to a temporary circuit in 1953. And now here we are. Since 1992, the racetrack has looked like this, 3.45 miles in length, and all kinds of elevation changes. That means all kinds of challenges. Great passing zone, difficult braking zone though, down into the turn one, then flying up through the S's, close to 170 miles an hour for these Lamborghinis as they head to the inner loop, and then down through the boot. Some great passing zones. The toe of the boot, the hairpin here, brings you up the hill. There's a look at the bus stop that was added in 1992. That's the inner loop. It cut down the straightway speeds into that big carousel at the end of the back straightaway and this racetrack has everything in the world that you could want and sometimes things you don't want welcome everyone i'm brian hill along with jeremy shaw we'll call all the action for you today and jeremy lamborghinis at watkins Glen. it doesn't get any better than this it does not brian a fantastic field of cars here the largest field ever in lamborghini super trofeo in north america unfortunately we lost a couple after the qualifying sessions this morning we had incidents for both uh, dan decker and for tom tate their cars that will not be repaired for today uh, tom tate certainly is done for the weekend uh, dan decker though they they it was just a, a rear corner on that car, but there wasn't enough time between qualifying and the race to get it prepared. But it should be out tomorrow. So uh, both drivers are just fine, and uh, they'll be watching this race uh, with, uh, with uh, great eager anticipation to get ready for tomorrow's race. When we talk about these cars on this racetrack too, Jeremy, and the speeds at which they traverse not only the corners but down the back straightaway, well over 600 horsepower, over 400 foot-pounds of torque, traction control, anti-lock brakes, and really not a lot of aerodynamics. I mean, obviously, this Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evo 2 is an aerodynamic car, but when you compare it to GT3 cars that run in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, the Lamborghinis there have a lot more downforce, and consequently, these here in Lamborghini Super Trofeo considerably faster down the straightaways. These cars are super fast. Yeah, I mean, they, they do over 150 miles now before they reach the crest of the hill. The S is there. I mean, these cars are really, really fast. A couple of drivers who are in this race will also be taking part in the Salem Six Hours of the Glen, the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship race on Sunday in GT3 Lamborghinis. And these cars are carrying about 15 miles an hour more as they head into the inner loop. So, yeah, they are a challenge. Yeah, well over 170 miles an hour, just cresting 170 miles an hour as you get on the brakes and only go down two gears for the inner loop. So you're not slowing down all that much from 170 to just under 100 miles an hour there to get it through the inner loop. We talk about the driver aids as well. Traction control, nine different positions, six-speed transmission, the ABS, the anti-lock braking system, 12 different positions there. So a very complicated car. And once again, four different classes, not of car, Jeremy, but of driver competing today. That's right. We have the pro drivers. We've got the pro-am class. We have am drivers. We also have the LB Cup, which is basically for drivers who've had very little racing experience. And uh, there's a full gamut of, uh, of uh, eight cars in the LB Cup. We lost one of them, Dan Decker, won't be racing this afternoon. But, uh, yeah, full field. So we've got six pros, 11 pro-ams, nine ams, and eight LB Cups. So a total of 34 starting this race. It's going to be a handful. It's going to be a really fun race. And, you know, we, we, we saw We've had two practice sessions yesterday, uh, qualifying this morning. Unfortunately, qualifying both of the qualifying sessions. There's 15 minutes of qualifying to set the grid for each of the two races this weekend. Both of them were interrupted by red flags. So the second race, actually no one got a flying, or only, only half a dozen cars got a flying lap in. So the grid for tomorrow's race will be set by practice times from yesterday in free practice two. Well, and if you're a fan of Lamborghini Super Trofeo, and why wouldn't you be, 
you might see something a little different right now, and that is on these reconnaissance laps, these pace laps. The clock has now started as they come across the line the second time. And this is a little different for this weekend, an action-packed, crammed schedule here at Watkins Glen. And the promoters always want to give these drivers an opportunity to get their tires up to temperature and pressure. There's typically a reconnaissance lap and then a single pace lap with a trip down pit lane in between the two. Really not time for that today, so they're going to give them two laps behind the safety car as they go out. But the clock starts on the second lap, so a little different than what you would normally see. The clock now running. We will have a side-by-side -side start when they come by the line the next time, but there'll be a couple of minutes off the clock because it's going to take probably three and a half minutes or so for this lap behind the safety car. The clock is running. It will. And so we have a run down to the, uh, the start your order for this race. Then it was 36 or 34th on the grid will be A.J. Muss, who's an AM contender for 47 most points. He actually qualified on the pole in the AM class, up inside the top 10, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, after qualifying, that car was uh, found out of technical specification. Uh, rear wheel camber basically was more than is allowed this weekend. So he's been put all the way to the back in car number 66. Alongside him on the group would be Chris Tasker in car number 45. Row 16, Ron Atapatu in car number 24 for Anson Motorsports. Alongside Raymond Davudi in car number 11. Row 15 on the grid is Tiger Tari in car number 17. Alex Lima from Brazil making his debut this weekend in the number 07 car. Ophir Levy will start in the 20, uh, 28th position alongside Fred Roberts in car number 89. Uh, ahead of them on the grid is Mark Wilgus in car number 50 and Jay Logan in car number 70. Row 12 is John Hirschberg in car number 86 and Graham Doyle in car number 10. Row 11, Jeff Courtney in car number 99. And then the LB Cup pole sitter for the first time, Rodrigo Vales, who did a super job for TR3 Racing, be fastest of the LB Cup contenders in 21st on the grid. 10th row, Todd Coleman making his debut this weekend in Lamborghini Super Trevera in car number 96, alongside Paul Nemshoff in car number 41. Row 9, Mo Dadka in car number 47, and Slade Stewart in car number 14. Row eight is Dominic Starkweather in car number 12 and Anthony McIntosh in car number 69. Row seven, Carter Williams, number 22, and Nico Riga making his return to the series this weekend in car number 20. Row six is Tyler Hoffman in the car number nine, second fastest of the AM contenders. Alongside him, Johannes van Overbeck in car number 68. On the AM pole, 10th position overall, David Starb in car number 48 for Precision Performance Motorsports. Alongside him, one of the Pro-Am contenders is Nate Stacey in car number eight. Two pro cars on row four of the grid, Jake Walker in car number 77 and Nico Jamin from France in car number 30. Row three is two Pro-Am cars, Luke Berkeley in car number 42 and Joel Miller in car number 55. Two pro cars on row two is uh, Kyle Marcelli uh, and uh, Ryan Norman, and on the front row, we get the pro am pole sitter John Capestro du Betts, and on the pole position for the first time in his career overall, Gianni Torino in car number 88 for TR3 Racing. A great field. They are lined up, ready to go. Preston Buckley in the starter stand looks over the field, throws the green, racing at Watkins Glen and Lamborghini Super Trofeo. Pro car on the pole outside the green and black. That's the pole sitter in the Pro-Am entry. You got to know who you're racing with. You're after your own championship. But up here right now in front with Pro and Pro-Am, you've got to get through this first lap, let things get settled down, and then you can get down to business. And a good start there from the pole sitter in that uh, Italian Tricolori colored car, the red, white, and green, Giano Torino. He's originally from South Africa, but his father is uh, very proudly from Italy. And those is the Italian colors. He colors on that... Uh, uh, carries on that TR3 car. Super start from him. He's won races before, sharing with Marco Spinelli last season, uh, but uh, this is his first time on the pole position himself and leading at the front and doing so very impressively. Very impressive. And Jeremy, we watched young Gianno Torino for the last several years. He just gets better and better, faster in the car, and I think better inside the helmet. He's thinking better. He's more mature. He's a better racer these days. And you see it right now on those cold hand cooked tires, able to pull out a lead right now. And it's beginning to stretch out just a little bit over JCD, John Capestro de Betts. He's got a great head on his shoulders as Giano. He's re a really focused young man. He was there late yesterday evening working on the cars, helping the crew get him ready for today's qualifying and then the race today. Really impressive young man. He's uh, you know, for, for somebody uh, that young, 
young, just 19 years of age. He's got a really good head on his shoulders. And what a great first lap this has been for Gianni. He's already pulled away from John Capestro Dubetz, who's doing a lot of racing in a lot of different series. And uh, Torino, he's got, what, 15 car lengths between himself and the second place car coming up towards the completion of the first racing lap. I'm going to look at the start line for the first time, as you said it. First lap in the books. Toronto has led it. Torino has led it, I should say. And then John Capestro de Betz. Kyle Marcelli now up to third after qualifying fourth. And after such a perfect weekend at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca for the number one car, were you a little bit surprised at the lack of pace? And I don't want to really call it lack of pace. We're only talking tenths of seconds, Jeremy. But were you surprised by the number one car in qualifying? Yeah, a little bit. They've been pretty conservative this weekend. I mean, they've got a good uh, lead. They, they won both races, the first two races of the championship this season at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca out on the West Coast. So they come here already with a pretty handy points lead. So, you know, they're just being cautious. That there's been a few concerns this weekend and they want to make sure that everything is under control they don't need to win every race and plus it's a long race it's 50 minutes they know they've got two fast drivers uh, in uh, in karma Sully and uh, from costa rica uh danny formal excuse me danny formal who will be driving the second half of this race so you know they've got good, good consistent pace between the two of them and so for for, for karma said in the early stages just kind of bide his time keep his position and hand the car over to Danny, who will see what he, he can do in the final stages. I think the big thing at Watkins Glen this weekend for every driver in Lamborghini Super Trofeo is that new tire that they're all running on. So it's really kind of a new ball game for all of them. It's one of those deals where you, you know the car and what it likes around this racetrack, but you don't know that hand-cooked tire all that well. This racetrack known for being really, really hard on the tires, and it's one of the reasons that in tech, there is a spec for the amount of negative camber that you can run. That's how the tires lean in at the top, hopefully not out at the top, usually in at the top, meaning negative camber. If you run too much negative camber, you get on that inside shoulder of the tire, heats it up a lot. So I think maybe for Kyle Marcelli, you pointed to it, Jeremy. Be smart with the car. More importantly, be smart with the tire because you don't know that much about it. And you've got to hand your teammate who's going to run to the checkered flag a good car that will be stable all the way to the end. Well, that's the key here, of course. And, uh, you know, that's certainly the, the Wade Taylor Racing with Andretti Autosport uh, camp. They're running uh, a handful of cars here. So, you know, they, they, they know what these cars take. The, the car that was uh, fastest in AM this morning uh, AJ Moss for 47 Motorsports. He was really, really quick. Uh, his teammates, Joel Miller uh, and uh, and Jake Walker were both fast as well. Not all of those cars, of course, went through tech. So you, you would think that all three 47 Motorsports cars were running the same specifications in terms of the setup going into qualifying. Uh, the two, the other two cars weren't teched, but uh, only one of them was, and that was the car that was ultimately thrown out and put to the back. So. Uh, I'm sure that team has gone to, back to the drawing board to make sure all the cars are properly uh, spec sp probably spec for this race with the right camber angles on those on those tyres. Because certainly running more camber is going to give you the better feel for the driver and, and more grip through the corners as well. But it also takes a lot more out of the tyres, and that is why that uh, camber restriction was brought in for this race weekend here at Watkins Glen International. Gianno Torino leads overall. Gian Capestro de Betz runs in second on the racetrack, but first in the Pro-Am class. He and his teammate championship leaders in Pro-Am, and then David Stav back in the Am category, runs 10th overall, but leads in Am. And Rodrigo Valles in LB Cup aboard the number 34 leads in that class. Four different classes of drivers, as we said. and. It, the reason that we point to drivers is because they all drive the exact same Lamborghini Huracan Super Trofeo Evo 2. And that is unique, I think, in motorsports, Jeremy, where the different classes, the different experience levels all drive the same car. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I think it really gives you as a driver a measuring stick. You're new. You want to come up. You want to improve. Well, guess what? The guy that's winning the pro races is running the exact same car you are. You've got something to measure from. Yeah, I completely agree, and uh, you know it's it, it's one of the cool things about this series. And there's there's drivers of all ages here, of all uh, levels of experience as well. And with uh, all there's so many teams, and having teammates to to compare notes with after each session, you know everybody can learn. 
So uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a tremendous series. It's really grown in stature and in, 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 de in demand over the last few years. We've got huge fields this season. 36 cars came here to start the weekend. Uh, and uh, there's, there's at least two or three more, I gather, that we could, could, be, we could be seeing over the next couple of race weekends. So it's a series that's on the rise. It's, it's extremely popular and getting more so. Extremely popular worldwide, three different worldwide Lamborghini Super Trofeo championships. And as you said, it continues to grow. The lead continues to grow for Gianno Torino out in front. Meanwhile, behind, things have settled down. And I think this is part of that unknown uh, about this new tire here at Watkins Glen. You're going to be smart. You're going to take care of it. You've got to have something to hand over to your teammate. This racetrack so fast, we talked about it. Well over 130 miles an hour from the time you enter turn two and climb the S's, you're over 150 miles an hour on the way out. Down at the end of the back straightaway, 5A and 5B, well over 100 miles an hour. So there are a lot of quick corners on this racetrack, which put serious, serious demand on the tires here. So you've got to be smart and hand your teammate a car to run to the checkered flag with Luke Berkeley aboard that purple Lamborghini as they head up through the S's and on to the back straight or it runs third in Pro-Am. Yeah, that's the key here is uh, you know, looking after the tires and making sure everything is, is in good shape for, for the end of the race here. We've still got uh, 38 minutes remaining. So it'll be, it'll be another eight minutes before the the pit uh, stop window opens. Everybody will have to make a mandatory pit stop and there's a minimum time that the, the cars have to spend on pit lane. Uh, and that time is measured as the cars come into pit lane to the time they exit pit lane and get back onto the racetrack. And that minimum time the, the, for, the, for the races this weekend is 120 seconds uh, for the driver, for the cars that have two drivers that have been sharing during this race. For the singleton drivers, the solo drivers, their sort will be three seconds more, a minimum of three seconds more, so 123 seconds for them. They've given them a little bit more time than usual here this weekend in order for each of the teams to measure the, uh, the uh, tyre pressures on the cars during the pit stop to make sure that they are again within comfortable bounds as far as the uh, tyre company is concerned and I think that's a really sensible move that is, uh, has been made by the officials this weekend so the pit stop's been a little bit longer than usual but it's the same for everybody. Watch the leader come down the front straight away. You can identify the different classes that are out there by that little triangle on the window banner upper right Different colors, orange for pro, yellow for pro-am, green for am, and blue for LB Cup. So in that right side of the windscreen, as the car is coming to you, you can see that color or as they go by, and you'll know what class it is. Also on the back of the car, there is a small chiclet, we'll call it, designating the class. So if you're behind somebody and you're not really sure who it is, you'll know whether it's your class car or not. By kind of identifying that little chiclet on the back that helps you know at least early on, do I really want to risk a lot to get by a car that's not in my class? But in that second run after the pit stop, if you're separated from your nearest competitor by another class car, I think the risk reward level has to go up, Jeremy. Well, yeah, that's right. And, and, and unlike in some series that have two drivers per car, uh, it's up to the teams and drivers amongst themselves to decide which of them starts the first race and which of them starts the second. We had two qualified sessions this morning, each of 15 minutes. Uh, the first driver, the, the first session set the grid for race one, this race this afternoon. The second 15 minutes set the grid for race two, although as we said, that was uh, cut short through, due, due to an accident. But uh, the, the, for some of the, the cars, the difference in lap times between the two drivers is pretty big. So you know, the cars might be fast at the beginning of the race and not so much at the end or the other way around. So again, it's, it's uh, paying attention to who is around you on the racetrack, just like you were talking about a couple of minutes ago. Nothing big here, at least as far as the lead goes. This is the AM battle for the lead. The 48 right now of David Staub has it. Second place, the number nine, Tyler Hoffman wants it. They've run this way for a while, and I've watched yeah. David Staub begin to kind of drift off of apexes a little bit, Jeremy, especially as they head down into the boot section of the racetrack, almost like the front end of that number 48 isn't quite working for him. Perhaps 
burning those front tires down. And when he does get to the apex like he did there in turn one, it seems like Hoffman has the better run through the middle of the corner. Yeah, David certainly did a good job in qualifying to get that pole position. He's holding on here, but not by much from Tyler Hoffman, who is right with him. These two very, very closely matched. Last season, David Saab just missed out on the, on the AM Championship. Uh, by, by four points, he was sharing his car last year with Nico Rigo, who's now driving uh, in the in, in a different uh, for a different team this year. But uh, he's hanging on here ahead of Tyler Hoffman, who's pretty experienced in a whole bunch of different cars, but not really in the pro racing ranks. But since he moved into this championship last season, he's gradually gaining in experience in these cars and races very, very well. Uh, Got to say, Gianni Torino at the front of the field doing super consistent laps. Each of his, the last two laps within a tenth of a second, and we were also within a two tenths of a second of his fastest lap of the race. His best lap was a 147.903. That was set on lap three of the race. Here we are now, seven laps in the books. His last lap was a 48.0, uh, and even that was a tenth of a second quicker than John Capestu Dubet's in second position. So really nice, consistent run for young Giano Torino. Just under four minutes to the opening of the pit window, and this order has settled down, and I, I really think that Kyle Marcelli running third in that bright red number one has just kind of said, this is where I'm going to run. We have a plan for the second part of the race. And I, I've got to tell you, it, running the plan a lot of times is frustrating, Jeremy, because you want to go, but your engineer is telling you, here's the pace I need you to go to make sure that your teammate has a car underneath them at the end. And right now, I think they're running the plan, not running the car wide open. Well, exactly right. And uh, you know, we talked about the two different drivers. Lucas Peterson will take over from Giano Torino uh, in the, uh, the, the car that's leading at the moment. So Lucas, this weekend hasn't been quite as quick as Giano, who's really Ooh. got to, to grips with this track extremely well. Um, uh, J JCD, John Capestro Dubetz, who's running in second position at the moment in the Pro-Am class. He will hand over the car to the Am driver, Tom Capizzi, who certainly isn't as quick as the, as the other pros that are running behind him, uh, which would be Kyle Marcelli at the moment and Ryan Norman. So for Kyle, uh, at the moment, he's about three seconds behind Gianno Torino. But again, with 30 minutes remaining in, the, in this race and with with Danny Formal to take over at the wheel after the pit stops. He knows he's, he's exactly where he needs to be in order to give Danny Formal an opportunity to challenge for the lead in the late stages. You know, it's interesting, Jeremy. Right now, I'm watching a lot of cars wander around a little bit. I just watched Kyle Marcelli through the inner loop, the bus stop, as we call it. Um, and well off of that second left-hand apex, and I would call it a mistake, but I'm not sure that it is. I think a lot of it may have to do with um, some of these regulations as far as setup goes, the camber and the toe in the back. We didn't talk about the toe. That's the angle of the tire, whether it points in or out on the, on the rear of the car. You don't want it pointing out by any stretch of the imagination. The more it points in to some degree, the more stability you have in the car. And so there is a toe-in limitation and there's a camber limitation. A lot of the drivers saying the car just isn't as predictable and stable as it has been uh, in the past with those specifications given to them as far as setup goes. And I think we might be seeing that yeah. in some of these apexes that are missed. The car just a little bit more unstable, unsure in the back. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, a few of the drivers have told me the car feels kind of floaty not as planted as it normally would be. Uh, and that's the result of, of those uh, restrictions that have been made to the setups of the cars this weekend. So they're, they're, they're not as comfortable. I mean, these cars, I don't think are comfortable to drive at any, at any particular time because they've got a lot of horsepower. They are seriously quick cars. Uh, and uh, you know they, they dance around through the corners with all that power when you try and put that power on coming out of the corners. Uh, and with the setups they've got now, they, they, you know, they, they wander a little bit. And they don't, they're not quite as confidence-inspiring, I think, as they, were, as they were for the opening race of the season out on the West Coast. But you know, it's the same for everybody. Drivers got to work with it. And they're doing a good job so far in this race. But it's nice and clean for this opening uh, 30 minutes. And the, the pit stop window is going to be opening in less than a half a minute's time. It might be too fast for some of the leaders to come in. But some of the guys farther down the field, they're going to be able to make their pit stop uh, at the end of this lap. Leaders working want. past Chris Tosca there and doing a nice job of staying out of the way. And 
you've got those battles all around the racetrack, like we talked about in the four different classes. And especially in, in classes like Pro-Am, it, there can be a, a pretty significant delta or differential between the pro driver in the car and the am driver in the car. And if you're in one of those other classes, you really want to know who's in the car during the stint that you're in, because as you approach that other car, you want to know what to expect from that driver that's in it. Yeah, is that, that is true. Here's this, uh, this battle going on for the AM lead with David Staub still holding on there ahead of Tyler Hoff. And behind the both of them is Johannes van Overbeck, who is making his return to racing this season. He retired, what, half a dozen or so uh, years ago. He's been in race control for IMSA for the last several years as a driver standard steward. And now here he is back at the wheel again. Uh, and uh, behind these two AM cars. So hats off to both David Starb and Tyler Hoffman for staying ahead of somebody as accomplished as Johannes van Overbeck. Absolutely. And the leader continuing to work through traffic. That was the 24, Ron Atapatu. The Elephant T entry that they just went by. Remember the 24, they had a great win at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. It was one of those deals where I think it was a, a little bit unexpected for Kevin Madsen and Ron Adipatu, but they played their cards just right in race one, came home with the win there. Not as fortunate in race two, but a great showing for that duo um, at, at the last round at, at, out in California. Yeah, very much so. I mean, yeah, it was definitely unexpected. I mean, they, they vaulted from nowhere. They were fifth or sixth, I think, on the last lap, and there was a, a big schmozzle on the last lap, and uh, they ended up the big, win big winners of it. But, you know, you've got to get yourself in position, haven't you, to win the race? That's exactly what they did. So hats off to them for doing that. Uh, it was a big feather in the cap, both for Ron and for... Uh, uh, for Kevin Madsen, who was making his debut, and a victorious debut it was for him in the Lamborghini Super Trofeo uh, in his home state. So he was pretty thrilled with that. Here is uh, Ron Atapatu in that number, that very distinctive Elephant T car, number 24, with the uh, United States flag on it. Really cool looking car. Uh, and he's going to hand over that car to Kevin Madsen for the second half of this race. The top uh, seven cars, well, the, the, the half hour had not expired by the, by the time they crossed the start finish line. The first of the of the cars on the lead lap to make his pit stop was kind of a 77. That's Jake Walker, who was running in eighth position. He is on pit lane and is about probably half the field onto pit lane at the earliest opportunity. Championship leader Zen Kyle Marcelli steps out of the number one. Danny Formal will take that over. And it's always amazing to me, you know when the car is working well. You saw Marcelli just step out, never said a word to his teammate. He had a job to do. He's got to get in, get strapped in. Marcelli just about his business, gets out of the pit lane, goes back over where he needs to be, just going through the motions that they have rehearsed so well. Some of the teams taking the time to change tire pressures. They're going to check the torque with that single torque wrench. Very minimalistic pit stops here. You're not fueling. You're not changing tires. And it's part of the beauty and the simplicity if you want to call it that when you have 600 plus horsepower underneath you, Jeremy, but it's part of the simplicity of the series. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's, it's pretty, it is a great series. This. I mean, it's, it's, the cars are so much fun to drive. It's, there's a fantastic camaraderie here. Lamborghini has a sensational new hospitality setup for this weekend. Uh, there's a lot of guests here, a lot of dealership guests as well. And in addition to the driver championships, there's also a, a separate championship for the teams and also the, de the dealers, the de dealerships around the country that are all represented on the racetrack. There's more than a dozen dealerships represented. A lot of them have guests here at the weekend. And, you know, there's a big party atmosphere down there. And I'm, I'm planning to join them to, for dinner this evening, if they have me. Uh, and uh, get to know some of these guys a little bit better, some of the, uh, you know, the, the people we don't see on a regular basis at the racetrack. But uh, look, hey, hey, Gianna Torino continues to lead. He's staying out. He'll probably stay out uh, as long as he possibly can before handing over the car to Lucas Peterson for the second stint. He's doing a really nice job. I mean, he's extending his lead over John Capestri Dubetz in second place. Uh, and he was pulling away also from uh, Kyle Marcelli, too. So he's, he's really doing a nice job. 1 minute 48.2 last time around for Gianno Torino. Uh, the only guy, I think that's faster than anybody else in this entire race. So that's how, how, how good a job he's doing. Consistent, fast pace at the front of the field for that distinctive number 88 car. Lamborghini Palm Beach, the dealership, 
associated with the 88. They've got to be happy. You watch the front end of the Lamborghini dive under heavy braking into what we call the heel of the boot. That's turn eight here at Watkins Glen. Then a very difficult kind of crest of a hill, turn nine, back onto what's known as the short course. And then the very, very quick turn 10 as Torino flashing the lights there saying, hey, I'm coming through. He doesn't want to be held up. Now is the time to make time on your other competitors while you've got clean racetrack. You've talked about how fast this car is, Jeremy. It looks to be one of the more solid chassis out there. I have not seen Torino off the apexes, not seen the car wandering like I have with some of the other quality drivers in the field. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it really is a, a very impressive performance. By far the best uh, for this young man in his in his young career. I mean, still only 19 years of age. He, he, he scored two, four wins last year uh, in the overall, along with Marco Spinelli, who's a, who's a factory Lamborghini driver. Uh, but uh, this year, uh, he's, you know, he's, he's the lead driver on this car, effectively, and for this team, TR3 Racing. It's a new team for him this season. He's really gelled well with that team. And, uh, and just, uh, again, good, consistent last lap around. A little bit slower because he had some traffic on that last lap, but it was still a, a 1 minute 49. So it cost him about a second, but still, you know, he, he's, uh, he's comf- comfortably ahead of John Capestri du Betz. First apex I've seen Torino miss as he headed down through turn six, the laces of the boot to the toe of the boot, climbing uphill, third gear corner, minimum speed in that corner. It's around 70 plus miles an hour. So even though it's a hairpin, because it climbs, you can get good grip on those hand cooked tires and accelerate up and off, up to fourth gear, and then back to third for turn eight. The right-hander that leads you back to the short course here at the Glen. Torino up front, then JCD. John Capestro de Betts runs second, but first in Pro-Am, followed by Joel Miller. None of those cars have made their pit stop yet. And the pit window will be less than three minutes to go. I would expect to see them in this time by. Uh, Yeah, probably next. They can probably do one more lap, I think, uh, without being worried about that Yeah, but you're risking it. No, not really. He's got, as you say, it's... it's, uh, what uh, two nearly three minutes lap around here is less than two so it should be fine as long as it's not a full course caution however if there's a full course that's, caution, that's my point well okay fair enough if there's a full course caution then bits are closed uh, and then he would be uh, well what's the technical term for that um, messed up let's say because uh, he would have to uh, delay his pits i mean the second place car i think has realized that here is john capestro du bets onto the pit lane and he will hand over this number 46 car for performance uh, uh, performance uh, precision performance motorsports to Tom Capizzi for the second stint. Capizzi comes around the back of the Lamborghini and he will take over from JCD. John Capestro de Betts, one of these drivers who has been known to us for a while, Jeremy, but really over the last, I would say, two seasons has come into his own. He's had more opportunity. And when you get opportunity, you have to make the best of it. And that young man has been able to do exactly that. When the opportunities have been given to him, he has made the best of him. And every time he makes the best of that opportunity, guess what? He gets another one. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? And uh, really, really impressive. He, again, he's a hard worker, as, as you suggest there. He's from uh, Southern California, from San Diego area. Uh, he's been coaching for, for a lot of years. And you know, this opportunity has come up. He's uh, hooked up with Tom Capizzi in, in a different series over the last couple of years. And the both of them decided together to move into Lamborghini Super Trofeo. And they've uh, taken to these cars like a duck to water last year. John Capestro Drew Betts drove in this series with a different co-driver, Bryson Liu, won the... Uh, the uh, Pro-Am Championship, now with the, with this different co-driver with whom he's driven in a different series in the past, Tom Capizzi, again in good in good uh, said coming into this weekend with a pole position today, he's tied on points with the uh, Shian Chandra Soma, who is the other points leader. Here, though, is our race leader, John Torino, in for his mandatory pit stop. Tell you, it just cuts it close, uh, right at a minute to go, and here's the problem. If you cut down a tire, The full course yellow, if they close the pit lane, that may help him because they may say, hey, there was a minute left. The next time by, you know, we'll let you in. But, man, you're relying. It's like playing baseball with a 3-2 count and relying on the umpire to put you on base. You know, uh, you don't rely on somebody else. You rely on yourself. You make good decisions. 
it just cuts it close, especially around a long racetrack like this. I would always like to have one lap in hand. If it works out this time, I'm just not that much of a gambler. Well, there you go. That's why you're not racing anymore. I mean, these guys, are, <laughs> these guys are, they take risks, don't they? And that's, it was a risk there for sure to stay out there, but it's paid off. He's come in. He's now made his stop. Lucas Peters is aboard that, is aboard that car there, checking the tire pressures. We've got the extra time set aside to do so. Uh, and then you know, when the, uh, the, the, there's a clock on the dashboard, it'll tell him when he can leave the pit stall. He knows exactly how long it takes to get from his pit stall, stall to the pit the exit line. And uh, that minimum time from pit in to pit out, he, he knows exactly everything is, is preset in these cars. It's sort of idiot proof. There's lights on dashes and all sorts of things these days to, to help the drivers, all sorts of driver aids, not like in our day, right? Well, I, I hope nobody messes it up now that you've said it's idiot proof, but um, yeah, it is fascinating how it is counted down. There's a system that most of these teams use that it, it does make it relatively simple if you maintain the speed that you're supposed to by holding the pit lane speed limiter button all the way in to your stop and all the way out and you sit for a certain period of time. It is simple math. Um, and then you can get back out there. But if you're short, you do pay a penalty. If you're less than a second short, there's a multiplier that gets put in. If you're more than a second short, well, the, pit, uh, the penalty is much more severe. Yeah, that's right. So that's certainly something that the uh, teams need to pay attention to. Here's look at the, uh, the pit exit here. That is the red and white Harrison contracting car of Danny Formal. And uh, he's quite a long way behind, isn't he? Uh, the uh, Italian livery car now heading out of the inner loop, whereas only now is uh, Danny Formal coming into it. So that's a pretty big deficit. That was a great first stint is. Uh, from, uh, from uh, Gianno Torino. Really, really impressive first stint. I agree, and I, I'll also harken back to something that I said earlier as I watched Danny Formal come into the bus stop under braking that time. The stability of the platform of the number one does not look as sound to me as the 88 that Gianno Torino has been on board that Peterson now has control of. It just doesn't look, I'll use a Joey hand term, it just doesn't look comfy, Jeremy, you know, both under braking and at corner entry. Yeah, I know, fair comment, I think, and that car has been planted. Uh, there's, you know, they've got lots of information from the drivers there at TR3 Racing. They've expanded with an extra couple of cars this weekend. I think that certainly helped them. Uh, and uh, John Torino is really, really taking advantage of that. Yeah, that, uh, is that, that the battle there as Peterson looks to the inside of a, a slower car coming to the final corner. That's going to cost him a fair bit of time. Meanwhile, Danny Formal now is right with Tom Capizzi and trying to make a pass, which will be for second position on the road. Well, John Torino was watching that. It might have taken a couple of years <laughs> off. <laughs> that was close. That was close. Your car in the lead, and then it, it, it's what we always say. It's never over until it's over. Now things are mixed up. It's a new group of drivers out there. No one really has been around each other, so you got to go kind of find your way and figure out who's where and who drives like what, and it's going to take a couple of laps to get that sorted out, especially as you're working through that traffic. Well, that's right, and, and the complexion of the, of the race could be quite different in the second stint because we're going to see the drivers that had their, the, 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 the cars that had their faster driver in early on slipping back now as the slower driver gets in, and other cars that had their that waited to put their faster car, faster driver in the car, they're going to move up as this race progresses. The, uh, the, the cars that don't have to change drivers, well, they'll be running a similar pace all the way through, but it's a fascinating format here. And uh, 9.5 seconds was the lead that Lucas Peterson had over Tom Capizzi in second position as they crossed the line to complete their 16th lap. Uh, that was the out lap, though, for Lucas. Uh, and uh, I think Tom Capizzi... I think he lost second position Ooh. overall to Danny Formal. Whoops, there's a mistake by Peterson at turn eight, Brian. That's going to bring uh, Danny Formal a lot closer. Is he in, in sight there? Yeah, just about maybe coming out of turn eight. Uh, that was interesting. He uses the runoff and now a problem for the 46 as well. The question is, is there something on the racetrack there, Jeremy? We've seen two cars, two Good cars, front-running cars, with a problem in the same brake zone. Whoops. Oh, and another one. Uh -oh. That's the 30. Yeah, that's uh, Sebastian Saavedra in the Ansem Sports car, running in a sixth position. 
uh, here, former IndyCar driver. He's uh, just his second second weekend in these cars. And another. Oh, oh yeah, that's Wesley Slim uh, in the car that was driven earlier in the race by Tyler Hoffman. That was car was was running for, well for the lead, challenging for the lead in the AM class. There must be yeah. fluid of some type on the racetrack. It seems to be between turn in and apex. We've had several cars with problems there. 46 goes around. That just looked like a spin on his own, and I would have said that's not a big deal. He just made a driver error, but we saw the 88 do it, and maybe Saavedra spins with sympathy, but I yeah. think he's a more experienced driver than that. I'm wondering if we've got some kind of a limited traction situation there. Yeah. Turn into apex. Could be and nine. And, and that spin for uh, Tom Capizzi, that cost Danny Formal quite a bit of time. He had to get on the brakes to avoid making contact with Capizzi. So he had not made that pass for second position before that moment for Capizzi. So uh, Lucas Peterson, even with that moment, it was a 1 minute 53.3 for him, whereas his, uh, his co-driver had been turning laps in the 48s pretty comfortably all the way through that stint, so it cost him a lot of time, but even with that, he was able to extend his lead over Danny Formal. Up into third position now is Ryan Norman in car number 84, then Jake Walker, who's done a really nice job for the 47 Motorsports team in car number 77, so the top four cars are all pros, there's another Ooh, several spinners. Right, here's what I see is raindrops on the camera, and I'm oh, thinking right. about the way this racetrack is laid right. out, Jeremy. Turn one is pretty much in line yeah, with exactly right. turn eight, where we saw the problems before. Yeah, and it, it is certainly uh, drizzling here. And contact. Turn one, there is some contact. That's the exit of turn one. Uh, right, so uh, top four cars are all pros. Then the Pro-Am leader is still Tom Capizzi. Bikorn Tandon oh. has closed him right down in car number 42. Uh, the youngster and the full course yellow. Okay, so the officials have recognized the fact that the track is getting really slippery out there. And out comes the full course caution with 13 minutes to go. Everybody on slick tires. If it rains heavily, uh, this race could be, uh, this could be it for the race. That's significant impact. Yeah. And I believe it looks like the 96. Uh, there, a lot of times you get that loss of grip going through one and the car hooks back to the inside. I think that's yeah. what has happened there. You see that rear damage. Find out what happens. Oh, he gets, you can tell that it's just no grip. Cars going off one, yeah. two, three. Yeah. And you would think it's... that there would be a slippery flag being displayed, the red and yellow flag being displayed at the entry to turn one. And he just gets up on the paint, which probably has moisture on it, and around it goes. Traction control is not going to help you at that point in time. Uh, no, it's not, is it? And uh, yeah, a lot of cars sliding wide there. So uh, Lucas Peterson still leads this race. But if we go back to green, it's going to take a while to sort out the field because there was a whole bunch of cars about to be lapped by Peterson. Um, and uh, there will probably be some cars in between Peterson and the second place car, which is now Danny Formal. He got past. Uh, Capizzi when Capizzi spun, um, but there's probably going to be some cars in between them if and when we get back to green. But for now, it's going to take quite a while to sort out this field. As you see, we've got cars directly ahead of the race leader, so the safety car is going to come out, pick up the race leader, and let those cars that are currently just ahead of him uh, pull away and go around to, to rejoin the back of the field. It was Todd Coleman aboard the 96 yeah. that had the problem in turn one. One of the cars that had a problem. He's the one that made the contact with the wall, unfortunately. Yeah. I think he's been able to drive that car out of the way. So the cleanup may not take very long, but we've got to get the field sorted, as you said, Jeremy, and get everything back in order before we can go back green. The interesting thing about this Watkins Glen International Raceway is that it is somewhat long and thin, and the weather systems that come through here can create an absolute deluge and havoc on one end of the racetrack, and the other end is perfectly dry. So for the drivers right now, if I'm Peterson out in front, I don't, I don't mind seeing this yellow flag, Jeremy. It gives me an opportunity behind the safety car to really take uh, stock of what the racetrack is like, kind of feel around for grip while I'm at reduced pace and kind of get an idea as to if we do go back green, where will I have grip and where am I going to need to tiptoe? Yeah, you, you're, you're absolutely right. And you know, if uh, there's no, doesn't seem to be any more rain at the moment. So if it stays, 
If there is no more rain, we should be able to go back to green. But if there is heavier rain with all the cars on slick tyres, I think the race officials would have no choice but to show the uh, the red flag and, and quite likely the chequered because this is a time certain schedule that to IMSA runs. There's uh, you know, more practice sessions and qualifying for different series to come up later this afternoon. So uh, they're not really going to have the opportunity to extend this race beyond the 10 minutes that are remaining right now. But the safety car uh, has picked up the race leader and there's what, one, two, three cars, I think, in between Lucas Peterson and the second place car overall. That's Danny Four Miles. So a couple of laps, three lap cars in between the first and second place cars. Don't see any windshield well. wipers are on on any of the cars, Jeremy. So that kind of tells me that the rain is gone. And it happens that quickly, doesn't it? It comes and goes. And if you're the unfortunate one, the first one into the corner where it has dropped some rain, I can't tell you how quickly the grip goes away when you're on slick tires and that racetrack gets just that little bit of sheen on it. All of the oil, the chemicals that have been dropped over the weekend, all of a sudden kind of come to the surface with that little bit of moisture that's there, and it just turns it into a skating rink. The, uh, yeah, yeah, these, these, these slick tires from Hancock, they work beautifully well on, on a dry circuit, circuit but it, uh, they have no tread, on, no tread pattern whatsoever. So if there's a layer of moisture on the racetrack, you're right, you're just hydroplane across the racetrack and you're off the road. Uh, you know, it's, it's not wet enough for that to be catastrophic at this stage. It's just easy to make a mistake here, which is effectively what those guys did. Uh, Tom, Tolman's car has been pulled out of the way at to turn one. So with a bit of luck, we should be able to go back to green before too long. Where are the cars now? They're headed into the uh, heel of the boots to turn eight. We Are the lights out on that safety car? Yep, lights right, are out on the yeah. safety car. You don't have to wait for those wave around cars to catch the rest of the field. You've given them the opportunity to get around and get away. You don't have to wait as an official for them to get back to the back. And that's exactly what's going to happen here with time winding down. Lights out on the Lamborghini Huracan safety car. Those wave around cars are exiting the inner loop and they'll have an opportunity to try to get as far as they possibly can. But we're about to go racing again. Green flag waves, Preston Buckley with the green in the air one more time and just over seven and a half minutes to go from Watkins Glen. Yeah, and there's three cars between uh, and already Danny Formal has got past one of them, but a good start, restart there by Lucas Peterson. Uh, Duke, looking back down the classes, Tom Capizzi still leads in Pro-Am in car number 46, just though ahead of Kion Tandon, another youngster in car number 42, who's uh, studying at university these days. He's at, at UCLA, is Kion Tandon. He's studying basically artificial intelligence, amongst other things, which is rather scary. But uh, really, really impressive young man. He's challenging for the lead in Pro-Am. In Am is David Starb, who just leads just from Glenn McGee right behind. That's number 48 and 69 battle for the AM class. And in LB Cup, Mark Wilgus had, had not been lapped by the leader. Second place car, Rahelia Perusia, had been. So Mark Wilgus had, has almost a full lap on the second place car in LB Cup. So that's car number, uh, car number 50 that leads in LB Cup. Brian Till, Jeremy Shaw with you. Lamborghini Super Trofeo action from Watkins Glen. And right now, the 88 out in front, Lucas Peterson behind the wheel, and he needs to put his head down and go. Even though there was considerable distance between himself and the bright number one of Danny from all, here's the reason, Jeremy. Short pit stop on the 88. There will be a post-race time penalty of 1.767 seconds. On the 88, he needs to go. Danny Formal needs to go and close the gap as well. If he can get inside that time, he effectively would be your leader. It's Peterson who leads in pro, Capizzi in pro-am, David Staub in am, and Wilgus in the 50 in the LB Cup. Yeah, that's a good uh, good restart lap there for Lucas Peterson. 1 minute 50.1. Danny Formal, the gap uh, back to second place. Four seconds between those two and only five minutes, five and a half minutes remaining in this race. So probably another three laps, I think, for the leaders. That rain seems to have uh, gone away right now, which is excellent news. Danny Formal is going to put his head down. He's just got past the number 07 car. That's one of the uh, AM contenders. But it's Pierre Kleinubing who's taken over from 
from Alex Lima in that car. And Pierre's quite quick. He did a good job to, to stay out of the way. Uh, and he's going to just bring that car home. He's running in sixth position in the uh, AM class, but a lap behind several of the other contenders. This is it. Just over five minutes to go, and Danny from all needs to go. There's still rain in the area. I saw some raindrops on the camera in turn one, and from all held up a little bit with that traffic. But no one in front right now of Peterson in the 88. That yellow sorted the field, moved everybody back around, and left the racetrack open. Jeff Courtney was the first in the 99 of those wave around cars, and he is well in front of the leaders right now. So. For Peterson and for Formal, you know, both of those crews, Jeremy, are on the radio going, leave nothing on the table. It is go time. Give us everything that you've got. For Formal, he doesn't have to get to the rear wing. He just has to get to within 1.76 seconds. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and with uh, the clock. He's closing. Away, he is closing quite rapidly. Yeah, yeah he, no, no doubt about it. But it's certainly more than that uh, time differential at the moment. We'll see what the differential is as they come across the line there. Uh, but certainly Danny Formal is pushing hard in second position because Peterson, he'll know what sort of, uh, he knows how quick Danny Formal is uh, and he's just got to uh, do the best he can. 149.4 there wow. for Lucas Peterson uh, against a 148.6 for Danny Formal. So that was uh, you know, just... He, he took off less... Go on. Less than a second. Yeah, he took off 0.8 seconds. Yeah, but there's, there's 3.2 seconds between them, and there's only three three laps to go. So uh, if Lucas can maintain that sort of pace relative to the other guys, he should be okay. Look at this battle farther down the field. Is uh, Shian Chandrasoma in car number 20 there is now in second position in pro and with Mark Miller trying to take that position away. There's a great battle going on for second position in Pro-Am. And uh, Tom Capizzi has actually pulled away a little bit, so great job by Tom in car number 46. He's running fifth overall, and uh, th and Mark Miller and uh, Shen Chandrasova got past Keon Tandon on that last lap. Look at this shuffling around into the inner loop. <laughs> and this is what Peterson wants to see. It's what Formal does not want to see for Peterson. Well, no, Peterson doesn't want to see it either. A full course yellow would stack the field together and his 1.7 second lead would be gone. He wants to stay green. Both of those drivers wanted to stay green. Last time by for Mao took 0.8 seconds out of the lead that Peterson has. What will it be this time? Just another few corners will know if Ramal has continued to close, he's running out of time, two and a half minutes to go. Yeah, so this is Should be uh, two laps. Pressure time for Lucas Peterson. Just uh, keep his keep his wits about him, just turn uh, good consistent laps here from here, and he should be okay. But uh, Danny Formal has just said hit that car's best middle sector on this race. So he is pushing hard, trying to catch the race leader. 3.29 seconds the last time by, this time by. 2.5. He needs another 0.7 seconds. He's been getting about seven to eight tenths of a second per lap. He can do it this lap if he has a good run. If Peterson has any problem, for Maul will be there. He needs that 1.7 seconds. Two to go. He's got time, Jeremy. He's he, got time. He has a formal has just set the number one car's fastest lap of this race. Even with the few spots of rain that we've had oh. on the race track, it hasn't slowed the track down. He's doing a really nice job. I mean, Lucas's last lap was a 48-7, and that was within a second of Gianno Torino in the early stages when the conditions were perfect. So uh, both these guys are pushing hard and doing a really, really nice job. Uh, just look at their sector times through the first sector as they head up toward the inner loop. There's only a tenth of a second between them. Man, and this is the first edge. time I've seen the 88 with that little wiggle in the braking zone. Lucas Peterson taking everything he can Holding on to that raging bull, trying to keep it in front of Formal. He needs that 1.7 seconds, as we said, because of the short pit stop. Two of the other guys flying through the field at the moment is Alex Prema in car number 70. He made Ooh. up uh, three or four positions on that last lap, and he's currently up to fifth position in Pro Am, 11th place overall in car number 70. Danny Formal is on the ragged edge, isn't he? He is, and, and, and if he runs a couple more corners like that, the officials will get on him yeah. for track limits violations. Yep. He's outside that painted track out curbing in turn eight. Both of these drivers leaving nothing on the table. 2.549 seconds the last time by white flag, and this time 
2.4. He needs 0.7. He wasn't able to claw any of it out just a tenth of a second that time. It's all come down to this final lap. The lap has to be perfect by both these drivers. A mistake by Peterson will hand the win to Fromal, and if Fromal makes a mistake, it's gone. Yeah, Lucas Peterson needs one clean, solid, no mistakes lap, and he's got this race won by a little bit of narrow margin. But uh, the, the team will be telling him exactly what he needs to do, and basically he needs to do whatever he did on the last lap, do it again right now. It was a 148.3 last time around for Lucas Peterson. That's a really good lap at this stage. I mean, these two are more than a second faster than anybody else on the racetrack. And they're pulling away. They've, uh, Ryan Norman is a full eight and a half seconds back in third position overall. But can, Dan, can Danny Formal close that gap? Through the first sector on this lap, he was about a tenth of a second quicker. But he's going to have to do more than that in the final, what, uh, mile or so now of this race. Interesting, though, the 88. I saw Lucas Peterson with a big slide in the middle of the bus stop. That will be lost time. Formal can see the car in front of him. He's trying to claw it down. He gained six tenths in the middle sector. That may be enough, is it? Three corners to go. Formal putting it all on the line, trying to stay perfect for he and his teammate this year, Kyle Marcelli in the Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti Autosport entry, but the 88. Lucas Peterson holds the fate of Gianno Torino in his hand. TR3 Racing looking for the win here. They'll cross the line first. They'll take the checkered flag. But what matters is the gap between the 88 and the one. And Formal takes it. Oh. Wow. Danny Formal with a spectacular last lap. But don't forget, three other classes yet to be decided. Tom Capizzi. Holding on, 46, looks to the line, leads the field by, Capizzi takes the win in the 46. John Capestro debats Tom Capizzi win in Pro-Am. Wow, great drive by Tom Capizzi. Oh, Taking over from John Capestro debats really, really impressive. There is David Starr to take the win in the AM class in caliber 48 for the Precision Performance Motorsports team. A little farther, or quite a long way farther back is Mark Wilgus for Forte Racing, powered by US Racetronics. That's Arrow uh, Lamborghini, the black and green car coming through the heel of the boot right now. He's got uh, a comfortable lead over everybody else in LB Cup. So this will be a, a third win, a perfect season it's been so far for Mark Wilgus. He won both of the LB Cup races at WeatherTech Raceway, Laguna Seca, and he's gonna get, a, if you get through this final couple of corners, another win here at Watkins Glen International. Mark Wilgus coming to the line, and as you said, continues a perfect season for him, just like the perfect season that Danny Vermeil and Kyle Marcelli have experienced so far. That was the fastest lap of the race yeah. for any car that Danny Vermeil put in. And what lap was it, Jeremy? Yeah. It the was the last one <laughs> where it all counted. It was, and, and Lucas Peterson, Peterson, his last lap was about six tenths slower than his previous lap. What did, what did they say halfway around that lap? He had to do exactly the same he did the previous lap. Unfortunately, it caused, he was half a second slower, and that was basically the difference between the two, because on corrected time, Danny Formal will take the win by 0.423 of a second. Heartbreak for Lucas Peterson and Gianno Torino did a fabulous job, but uh, Danny Formal, hats off to him. The Costa Rican uh, comes through at the last gasp, a, a brilliant final lap to take the victory for Wayne Taylor Racing with Andretti Autosport and Harrison contracting Lamborghini and representing the, uh, the, the dealership uh, from uh, Palm Beach who is already leading the dealership championship coming into this weekend. And that, that just has to be absolute heartbreak for Lucas yeah. Peterson, Gianno Torino coming across the line first but finishing in second and for the championship Jeremy, that's just an added bonus for Marcelli and for Mal. Yeah, I mean, he's been, yeah, it, it really is. And, uh, and you know, I'm sure the officials will, will want to look at the onboards there to see whether Danny Formal was exceeding those track limits because they've been calling track limits penalties all weekend long. If, they, uh, if he did ex exceed the limits, it certainly looked like he was off the road at turn eight on that last lap, I must admit. So uh, I'm sure the teams, the other teams, particularly at TR3 Racing, will want the officials to have a look at that uh, and perhaps uh, you know, see, see whether that win is, uh, 
is going to stand, but it was certainly a brilliant final lap. I mean, he really put everything on the line there, did, did Formal, and comes away with the win, and uh, impressively so. Danny Formal, I'm sure that, I mean, think about this. He didn't even know, right? He's putting in the drive of his life. He doesn't know when he comes across the line with the 88 in front until the team looks at the timing, it's corrected, and then he can finally breathe. Because I got a feeling over that last 3.45 miles, Jeremy, he didn't take a breath. No, I think you're probably right. <laughs> he did hold his breath. I think it was, he was, you know, the, the good, I mean, he had nothing to lose there, just everything to gain, just go as fast as he possibly could on that last lap, nailed the lap uh, and comes away with the with the victory. And uh, as, as we say, a heartbreak for certainly for the number 88 team, but uh, hats off there to uh, Danny Formal and Carl Marcelli, who you know, just bided his time in that early stage of this race. He, uh, he, he just did exactly what he, what he needed to do. And uh, Danny Formal did the rest from there. Danny Formal, another driver in the field that's cementing his reputation yeah. as not only a race winner, but a championship contender yeah. and a champion as well. When you look back to last year, 11.05 tomorrow, Lamborghini Super Trofeo North America comes at you again from Watkins Glen. It never disappoints the racing, always spectacular. The Raging Bulls back at Watkins Glen. We'll see you tomorrow. For Jeremy Shaw, I'm Brian Till. Take care, everyone.